Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time zone you're on. Uh, welcome to this Twitter Spaces discussion on how to write news analysis. My name's Catherine Mackey. I'm your moderator today, and I'm an editorial associate with the Thompson Foundation. We're helping journalists around the world improve their writing, storytelling, and analytical skills through a series of three courses called The Art of Storytelling. The courses are free, and you can access them via our website, which is thompsonfoundation.org. We'll be drawing from the third course in that series in particular today, and it's all about how to write news analysis. Hopefully, you'll get some tips and advice from our fantastic panel throughout this discussion, which we're co-hosting today with the third poll. Uh, third poll, if you don't know them, it's a multilingual platform dedicated to promoting information and discussion about the Himalayan watershed and the rivers that originate there. We want to hear from you today. That's the important thing. Your questions, please. Uh, we know there are challenges, even some confusion around news analysis. What is it? How it differs from straight news or opinion pieces? Let us know what you think. Uh, please send us your questions now or any ideas maybe that have worked for you that you want to share. Um, as I say, we've got a great panel. I'll introduce them in a moment. Um, but I just want to ask Georgie, who's at third poll, who she's going to be keeping across your questions. Um, Georgie, just let people know how they can get in touch, please. Hi, thanks, Catherine. Uh, I'm really looking forward to this discussion. And yes, please do send in any questions for our panellists. You can do this via direct message to the third poll or the Thompson Foundation, or you can write your question in a tweet and tag us. Um, if you're joining via the Twitter mobile app, you also have the opportunity to request to speak using the microphone icon on the bottom left of your screen, um, and we can accept your request at the right time. Great. Thanks, Georgie. Now let's meet the panel. Uh, Ewan McCaskill. Ewan is the journalist who has written the three Thompson Foundation courses on storytelling, including the art of writing news analysis during Ewan's 22 years on The Guardian, he won a Pulitzer Prize for his work on the disclosures from Edward Snowden about the activities of the American National Security Agency. He's also an Emmy Award winner. Farhanaz Sahidi is the Pakistan editor for Third Poll. Prior to that, she was head of the features desk at the Express Tribune. And Helen Shikanda. Helen is the science and health reporter for the Nation Media Group in Kenya and an Oxford Climate Journalism Network fellow. Uh, welcome to all of you. Uh, what a lineup. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, Ewan, I want to start with you. It's a question I alluded to uh, in the opening. What is news analysis? How would you define it? Um, I, as you said, uh, it's a difficult thing to define. Uh, but what it is, in news stories turn, tend to be formulaic, uh, news stories, you have an intro with the main facts at the top uh, and then the rest of the story in descending order um, of importance and you put in the basic facts. Um, so if you see a news report in one newspaper and you turn to another newspaper, you'll see basically the same kind of story, the same whether it's a broadcast or whether it's in print. Um, news analysis is taking a step back. It's something extra. It gives. It's trying to explain more the background to the uh, news story. Uh, it's giving context. It's giving uh, more uh, more information. Um, it tends to be more reflective. Um, is it? Is so quite often, Is it the why yeah. something has happened as well? Um, I think that's a good way of putting it. Yeah. It, it's, it's why something um, has happened uh, and why it matters. Um, quite often I've read a news story and I'm still left wondering about uh, you know, the meaning of the story. And hopefully uh, the news analysis provides, uh, it's like an explainer. It, uh, it'll answer the kind of questions that are left lingering from the new, news story. It's a wonderful thing to write. You can write it in a thousand different ways. Um, and I think that's one of the things that makes it attractive, both for a reporter and, and for um, the audience. Uh, as I said, you know, with news, a news story tends to be formulaic. It's the same wherever you go, uh, mainly. Um, but a news analysis gives you something different. 
it, it gives a, a news organization an edge, especially in this day, day and age. So it's it's uh, an explainer, it's an extension of reporting. Uh, the thing you said about it being a wonderful thing to write, I think we'll come on to that in a bit when we talk about how we actually write news analysis. I just want to very briefly touch on here because it's something we'll expand on later. I mentioned in the opening how it's different to an opinion piece, say. Are the two distinct, do you think, news analysis and opinion pieces? Uh, I, I, absolutely. Um uh, that's spot on, Kath. Uh, a news story, you stick to facts. Uh, opinion is uh, someone is allowed to express the, their own personal views. Um, a news analysis is the same as a news story. It's an extension of a news story. Uh, so it has to be a piece of reporting. Uh, you can't put your own views into the uh, news analysis. The news analysis uh, follows the you know, you need to quote people, you need to be accurate, uh, honest, you have to be transparent, and above all, you have to be news- neutral. Uh, you can't allow your own uh, personal views to intrude into um, a news analysis. So news analysis is uh, just a continuation of reporting, but it's cer- certainly not opinion. There's a lot to get out there, and I'd like to um, maybe expand on that and, and hear from our audience about what they think about analysis versus opinion a bit later on. But Farinaz, if I can just bring you in here, you're someone who commissions journalists to write news analysis pieces. So why do you commission it as opposed to, say, a straight news story, which, you know, I'm sure you commission as well. Why commission analysis? What what are, what else does it offer? Thank you so much, Catherine, for having me on board today. And this is, uh, I hope to learn a lot from it as well. Um, So when we're commissioning, uh, before going on to why, um, it's important to understand that we are living in the era of hybrid. And uh, so news analysis is really a natural progression of how news is going to be. Um, The attention spans are limited. News breaks very, you know, suddenly. And the challenge with news analysis is that you're not breaking the news. So it's already out there. What is the value that we can add to it? How can we take a deeper look at what has already been said? And in that sense, while it has to be an objective piece of reporting, the challenge is who to assign it to. Because you do need um, a journalist or somebody who's reporting who has a fair grip on the subject and who knows what they are talking about. And they have had um, a fair look at what and how that particular thing has been reported. So when we need a deeper look, I think that's when we go towards uh, the news analysis pieces. Uh, If anybody would have seen in the third poll recently, we had two or three great examples. So, for example, a very senior journalist of ours, um, an editor, Joy Deep, he wrote about the Joshimath disaster. Um, and um, it had already been reported, but then he used comments from experts and uh, his own expertise was drawn into it as well. So um, more than why I would assign it to somebody, for me, it's, it would also be a question of who I would be uh, commissioning um, a news analysis piece. Are there common mistakes you think people make? when they're writing news analysis as opposed to a news story? What sort of mistakes come across your desk? So um, the most common one is, um, well, giving your own very strong opinion because the lines are very thin in between uh, these three categories. And so from being an objective piece of reporting, it goes on to being basically an opinion piece because that's the uh, when you're jumping the gun, the word analysis takes you over there that, okay, it is my analysis, which it's not. However, your own expertise and understanding of the subject does come un- into play over there. So that's uh, one of the things. And I think uh, more than writing it when we are creating story briefs or story ideas for something, when they are pitching it, I think that is when they need to know, as journalists, we all need to know what exactly is it that we are pitching. Is it a news report or a news analysis or an opinion piece? 
is also a mistake as well, retelling the story. That's what you don't want to do. Oh, you don't want to do that and you don't want to give a synopsis or a summary of the same thing. Uh, and you don't just state facts as uh, and when they happened. You have to add something additionally, which has already not been reported. Helen, let's bring you in. As someone who's sort of relatively new to journalism, you've been doing it, what, for four years. I, I wonder if you recognise these common mistakes that Faranaz uh, uh, and you and alluded to, particularly when it comes to opinion. Uh, uh, have you ever fallen into that trap yourself? Um, hi, everyone, and I'm so glad to be here today. So when writing an analysis, I have sometimes fallen into that trap of putting in my own uh, expertise because when you work on a specific subject, for instance, I write mo mostly about climate and health, you tend to become a mini expert. So you know so much about what you're writing. So when you start writing an analysis, you tend to put your own opinion instead of just going to speak to an expert or just to refer to a research paper. So that mistake of having your opinion in the paper is something that maybe we can um, filter through and know the difference between an opinion and analysis. Just before we move on, um, um, Ewan mentioned it's a wonderful thing to write. How difficult can it be to get analysis right? Is it something you enjoy doing as a journalist? It's something I, I can say I enjoy doing because before you write an analysis, you have to have had prior knowledge of the uh, the story that the breaking story that everyone has talked about because right now we are in a digital era and everyone wants to be fast but now how do you set yourself up, uh, apart from uh, this story that was broken yesterday when you add more in-depth to to the story you do more research you invest yourself in you invest so much energy in doing research for for that story you end up writing a uh, a critical piece that is that you enjoy um, the output instead of just writing what everyone already has. It sets you apart from just every other journalist who is looking for clickbait. So it sets you apart and uh, no doubt makes you more employable, I would say, as well. You've got another string to your bow. Just before we, we move on, just a reminder, we want to hear your questions, please. Uh, you can direct message Third Pole or Thompson Foundation. Uh, you can put your question in a tweet and tag us. And if you could please include the hashtag journalism now, uh, that would be great. Um, let's get down to the nitty gritty, I think, of how to write news analysis. Um, Ewan, if I, if I can come back to you, um, what advice do you have? Because, I mean, you're a seasoned journalist and, and it, can be, it can be a wonderful experience to try something new, but it might be a daunting prospect to start with. Now, I know in the course you, you sort of develop some sort of template of sorts. So I wondered if you could just I expand on that, really, and, and how should, where should they start? How do you begin? Um, I, the first thing I would do is something you've already alluded to, which is you'd, the common mistake is to repeat um, the information in the news story. Uh, so what you have to do is you have to stand back, um, do some research, uh, whether it's Googling the background to a story or preferably speaking uh, to analysts or maybe people at the scene or people are just getting in touch with people who are affected um, by, say, a government decision. Uh, so you have to do your research uh, when you've done that, you look at what facts you've got that are fresh and are new that aren't in the news story. Uh, facts that you think are interesting and will help uh, uh, a reader or a listener's understanding. So what you've got all these wonderful nuggets of information. Uh, you're keen to get them down. Uh, and then you say, well, how best can I present this? Um, you could write maybe 600 or 800 words. Um, my, I think, to, to me, the best way, I like to do question and answer. So I'll pose a question, uh, and then the facts that I've uh, gathered um, will provide an, a, an answer. And then just maybe five or six uh, questions, uh, and then you've got a question and answer. Uh, it's the easier 
for readers and listeners to digest uh, if you do it in that kind of bite size uh, format. That's about sort of including your audience and knowing what your audience wants, which we can sort of um, develop in, in, a, in a moment. I just want to sort of recap what you've said there. So do your research, get some fresh facts. Is it also important to, to uh, which we've said before, tell people why it, ma- why it matters and why it matters to them and not necessarily a person sitting in government? Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, you you have to know you have to know your audience. You, you have to know who you're sort of writing or broadcasting to, uh, what's going to interest them, uh, how much information are they likely to know already. Um, so that that's the I mean that that that's pretty uh, fundamental. Um, you're you're not repeating, say, government uh, news or government propaganda. You're trying to come up with the most honest account or explanation of why the government's taking this decision or um, you know, whatever the story of the day is. You're trying to provide uh, an honest uh, account, uh, explanation of, of why uh, why this is in the news. Um, Faraz, I wonder how you approach it. If we look at those key words that, that Ewan said, he said, you've got to make it interesting. You've got to have fresh facts. Um, explaining climate change, because obviously Third Pole does a, a environmental stories a lot about climate change. It's a very important subject, but it can be very dull. So I wonder, do you end up re-editing a lot of copy sent to you to try and make it interesting? What sort of things are you looking for? Well, to start with, um, as you said, it can be a dull and dry subject. And our challenge is... Um, how to make it interesting and readable. So the human-centric angle is always there without it being a feature. Uh, Maybe a mention there, uh, a sentence or a um, a, a definite um, uh, touch over there, how it's affecting people on ground. Uh, Numbers in the newsroom are always uh, a writer's or a journalist's friend. So uh, using the numbers makes it really, really interesting. Um, And also uh, taking it forward from what you were saying about knowing your audience, I think it's equally important that the audience knows you and what you're presenting. So as Irwin said, I hope I'm pronouncing the name correctly, um, he spoke twice about honesty, and I think it's important that we label it honestly. Uh, what exactly is it which we are presenting? Is it actually an opinion piece and analysis or is it news that they are reading? And uh, to make it interesting, I think facts, numbers, uh, quotes, uh, quotes from people who actually haven't been quoted earlier. Um, those are things that, uh, you know, I would be really relying on. Yeah, you mentioned honesty and labeling. They are key things and we will come to that. But just to stick with the the nitty gritty bit, if you like, of how to write news analysis. So we've got human centric research, fresh facts, quoting new people, uh, know your audience, which, again, we can expand on in a moment. Um, Helen, I, I want to just ask you the same question, particularly about the interesting and how you approach it. You got some inspiration, didn't you, from a medical book about the gut of all things. Can you just sort of tell us a bit about that? Uh, yes, so I've always told this story on why I got into science journalism, and it's because of a book I read, it's called The Gut by Gilia Enders. So this, um, Gilia Enders is a, a, a doctor, and how she wrote that book in a very simplistic way made me have that urge to, to like, when I got to the newsroom, I wanted to do exactly what uh, she did but in a different way in a way that Kenyans can understand science in a way that I can explain to Kenyans what climate change means so that they don't get bored with climate change because most people think that when you write science you just have to put in the hard facts you like sort of all the jargon you know in the world but if you want to achieve the end goal, then you have to simplify it and add new knowledge that people don't know about it. So this book really inspired me to get into science journalism. And I always uh, I like telling people about that story. Great. Uh, thanks very much, 
um, Helen. Uh, we've got a question actually from Sadiq. Sadiq wants to know what are the sensitive areas that one needs to focus on when analysing news? Um, I don't know if any one of the panel wants to pick that up. What are the sensitive areas that one needs to focus on when analysing news? Um, Faranaz, I was actually going to go to you next, and I think Sadiq's question leads into that about maybe the sort of issues that lend themselves best to news analysis. Or are there issues you should steer clear of? Or are there key topics? Or does any news story allow, allow news analysis? I think that would be true for uh, any kind of packaging or any kind of approach to journalism, uh, whether it's an analysis or a news report or a news analysis, as in uh, versus uh, an opinion piece. There are certain subjects that are sensitive, um, anything that is volatile, anything that can uh, trigger uh, a lot of emotions. Anything that can have a transboundary impact, anything that cannot be discussed because of um, the situation between two countries, uh, say. So uh, those things are there. It's how one approaches it. Um, news analysis is still actually quite uh, a safe space to be in because while we are reporting, we can also analyze news that has already been around. So it actually gives us a safer space to touch upon sensitive issues. Uh, when we break a news on a very sensitive issue, that's when we have to be very careful with the word. And particularly in opinion pieces, because that is uh, where one is entirely responsible for what one is saying. So um, I think it's the same for all three genres, but um, news analysis would be the safest bet, actually. Um, I want to just take, you mentioned an example earlier, Faranaz. I want to have a quick look at, at, at a piece you commissioned for the third poll. It's on China's shifting energy investments in Pakistan from coal to renewables. Um, I think we can share that story live now on the third poll and Thompson Foundation Twitter feeds. Uh, so uh, anyone who's interested can, can read it later. Um, why did you think that would be a good subject for analysis as opposed to a straight news story about China's energy investments in Pakistan? So actually, uh, this particular journalist had um, offered to write on it and it was supposed to be an in-depth investigative, which it was. But over the period of time, we realized that uh, the journalist in question uh, was a sort of expert in the field and knew a lot more than we had um, envisaged. So um, that is why it went on to become a news analysis piece. And uh, we commissioned it and we went over each and every layer of how we could take a holistic look um, at uh, China's shifting energy investments in Pakistan from, from coal to renewable. Uh, incidentally, now new news reports are saying that it might not be the case, but it was the case at that time. So uh, we wanted to take um, a look at the whole thing and uh, what we were expecting, we actually got it as well or better. And the editors did a splendid job as well. Um, the end result was something for which the journalist actually traveled to those places. So while it was a news analysis piece, it's a classic uh, case in point that he did his fair bit of work. He went to those places. He uh, uh, visited those places. He did his research uh, across the country. And uh, the response was very good from the audience. I think when it's uh, honest and... Uh, well-researched journalism, which has been written and edited smartly, uh, we always do get the response that we are looking for. So honest, well-researched, and importantly, you visit the area uh, you're talking about. Um, you mentioned the audience there. You and I just want to ask you, you already mentioned about how you sometimes write analysis as a question and answer session, because you're thinking about your audience. How important, just sort of tell us a bit more about how important it is to know your audience and maybe even how they're accessing the analysis you're writing. Uh, just to pick up on the point that Faranaz was making, uh, I was totally in agreement with her. Um, 
one of the listeners, I won't embarrass uh, the listener, um, the, uh, he's a journalist and I was chatting to him over the last few days. Uh, and uh, he uh, got a freelance commission to write a piece of news analysis. So it's if, you, if you're a freelance, you, ha- you don't have to think just in terms of writing news stories. There is a demand for uh, news analysis. Um, and, and what this uh, journalist, uh, who may still be listening, did, he did exactly what uh, Faranaz uh, said. Uh, he went, there was a, the news story uh, was broken last week, but he went to the village uh, at the centre of this news story he made the journey, and when he got there, chatting to people, he realised the story was much more complicated, much more nuanced uh, than uh, we were led to believe just from the news story. Uh, and as a, res- as a result of that, uh, he's able to provide a news analysis that provides a much wider pers- perspective on the story than was available for, from the original news story. Um about knowing your audience, um, it, as part of the course, I, I was writing about um, uh, an example of a story about um, e- e-bikes and uh, the the sort of bikes that you can rent in cities. And uh, I was took took as an example um, China. Now there'll be some people in Britain uh, where I live in London who'd be interested in what's happening in China. But most of the readers in Britain wouldn't necessarily be interested in e-bikes in China. So if I was writing that story, I would give it a British example, uh, a a sort of British um, context. So if I was explaining the arguments for and against um, uh, e-bikes and sort of, you know, renting them, I would put my audience would be in the UK, so I'd be writing for a UK audience. Um, Yeah, I think that's key, isn't it? Sort of making it relatable and relevant to your audience. I just want to read something that was in the 2022 Reuters Digital News Report because it relates um, to news analysis and audiences. It says a significant proportion of younger and less educated people say they avoid news because it can be hard to follow or understand The report says this suggests that the news media could do much more to simplify language and better explain or contextualise complex stories. So in other words, provide easily understood news analysis. So it actually looks from that as if audiences want journalists to write more analysis. Um, is, Is that something, Helen, if I can ask you, is that something you agree with? Do you find you factor in your audience when you're trying to write news analysis? And is it something that goes down well with them? Yes, I have to factor in my audience because when, you, when you're when you writing a, a science piece, for instance, and you just want to write for yourself, then you won't achieve the end goal. Because when you're writing an analysis, you have to know the why. And if your why is to reach or to inform policy change or to change perspectives, say you're writing an, an analysis about vaccine misinformation, why people should take up COVID-19 vaccines. So if you write in a way that they don't even understand, you don't have people, relatable stories, then they won't, the end goal won't be achieved and you'll just have written for yourself or for your editors and the researchers. So as they always say, simplicity is king or some people say queen. So if you factor in what I said earlier in why I started writing science journalism, to simplify the most complex things to the people who consume news, then that way you will have achieved your your goal of writing a news analysis. Uh, Great. Thanks, Helen. Um, I want to come back to to talking about this key point, I think, that we've touched on throughout about uh, opinion uh, versus analysis, because we're getting quite a few questions in. I've got a question from uh, prolific Edward Frimpong, that's a, that's the name, how, who wants to know how challenging is it to write news analysis on a heated political issue like an upcoming national election? And a question, a similar question from Lee Wei Soon, how to avoid putting our own opinion when writing news analysis? Um, 
I think those kind of things are key, aren't they? Particularly on social media now where things are so polarised, where people are very passionate about um, what they think. Uh, Ewan, you've already made it clear that writing news analysis isn't the same as writing an opinion piece. Can you sort of elaborate, really, on what's the difference? If you take a topic um, like, say, you know, the British government... um, is dealing with uh, illegal immigration and boatloads of people coming over um, uh, you know, across the channel. Now, I could write an opinion piece saying, uh, an opinion piece I might write say, I don't think illegal immigrants should be allowed to cross the channel and uh, the French government should um, uh, stop them leaving from France to come to uh, England. Um uh, I would say that, you know, uh, England is already too full. Uh, it's got too many people. Uh, uh, it doesn't need uh, more uh, immigrants. I mean, that that's opinion. That's not fact. That's not being neutral and reporting things. A piece of news analysis would look at what, what, what why does the French government not stop these boats um, crossing? What, why do people want to come to uh, England. Uh, where do people come from? Uh, so you're giving, um, as Farhan, uh, Farhan has said earlier, uh, you're dealing with facts and figures and you get, you speak to analysts, uh, you speak to people not in the news story, but it is, it's reporting. You're reporting, you're sticking to facts, uh, figures, uh, quotes from people. It's not your opinion. Uh, you're useful, you're objective. And even if, if it's, like, say, like an election, uh, yes, it's heated, uh, but you're not, you're not, you're a, you're a reporter, you're not taking sides, you're not, you're not, you're not backing one party against another. Uh, you're reporting the, the sort of strategy of each party, you're quoting what leaders of the parties say. Uh, and as part of the news analysis, you might go to an opinion pollster and the pollster will say uh, party X is ahead in the polls uh, and it's because of got more appeal. You might speak to a political scientist uh, uh, at one of the universities and uh, ask for uh, what their opinion is. Uh, but, but that's their opinion. Uh, you're, you're sticking to uh, facts. You're, you're not putting your, yourself in the middle of the story. You mentioned sort of the key word objective there, and as a as a journalist, BBC journalist of thirty years standing, it was it was beaten into us almost this idea of objectivity. Um, it's a question I'd like to ask the audience as well, what they think about this word objectivity. Um, but the question is, you and is it possible? Do you think to be completely objective? Um, um, you know, for the last twenty or thirty years, um, I've been saying I don't believe in objectivity. Um, and that was that was an unusual thing to say. Uh, to we, we, we're human beings, so we, we are subjective. As soon as you decide to report on something, you've made a subjective de- decision. You, you've decided you think this is important, and it, it's difficult to avoid um, you know, your your own prejudices. Um, so I think objectivity is the wrong word. Um, uh, the I think the the be, the better word is to be fair. Um, if you're reporting, say, an election, you have to be fair to the person speaking. It might be a party leader. You don't distort their words. You don't change it. You you present to the reader or the listener the most honest account of uh, what's happening in that election, but not not introducing your own uh, prejudices. Um, in, in America, they still adhere to the idea of the old-fashioned objectivity, um, where you have a you have one paragraph uh, quoting uh, quoting someone, then your second paragraph will be quoting someone else. It's a kind of artificial balance, um, I, and I, I think that kind of old-fashioned objectivity is probably gone now. Um, thanks for that. And as I say, um, let us know in the audience what you think about this idea of 
objectivity. Um, you can direct message us or tweet us, Thompson Foundation or Third Poll, and hashtag journalism now. Um, Helen, you write on topics that people are passionate about. You know, I've not met an environmental reporter who isn't passionate about climate change, for example. You, you also mentioned earlier, we talked earlier about falling into the trap um, of, of offering your own opinion and how you try and avoid that. But just how hard is it to keep your opinion to yourself? You know, when you've written a piece of news analysis, do you, do you filter it for any signs of your own opinion being revealed, as it were? It's kind of hard to filter your own opinion because unless an editor has commissioned you to work on a story, most of the time the stories we write is based on our ideas, like w the things we have read online, the things we have researched on. So that means that you have some sort of bias on why you want to do that story. So to sort of make your story to be objective, you have to involve a lot of experts, not the same experts, different experts with different opinions, so that even when you're writing, you will have um, different views from different people. And even if your, your opinion is the, is to come out then it lets the editor speak for the for you for you because sometimes you may ask you may even the opinion your opinion may come from the questions you ask the experts you may ask leading questions that you want your own opinion to come out at the end of the day so to avoid that is to ask questions that are not leading the experts to answer you what you want to hear but questions that have an op let the experts have an open idea of what they want to respond to so experts are really important and the questions that you ask also and the bias you should not have your bias when uh, writing an analysis yeah open questions are key aren't they just a good journalism never mind news analysis the who what when where why so you don't lead someone into saying what you want them uh, to say. You've mentioned experts. I'm, a, I'm about to talk about, so I was about to ask you about the importance of experts, but I just want to go to a question from Shazeb Hassan. Um, this might be one for you, Farinaz. Um, what do you suggest for the writers from Gilgit Baltistan who don't find, don't find large readership? Um, they feel marginalized and their views are not usually published by the Pakistani media. Um, so I guess they're asking where should they go to to sort of get pitch pitches for their for their news analysis. Thank you, Shazi, for the question. If it's about climate change and the environment, please pitch to the third poll. And uh, if it's uh, something that we can carry, then we would be happy to. But coming back to that, I think it's also a matter of um, the skill building and the capacity building of the journalists uh, and the reporters from different regions. Um, it's also about how you present your story. Uh, it's not always that their voices don't, they don't have forums or platforms where the voices wouldn't be heard. It's also about how uh, the story is presented, how it is pitched, whether all aspects are covered. So it's also about um, upping your game as a journalist. That's also a part of it. Um, that would be my answer to him. Um, thanks very much, uh, Farinaz. And uh, another appeal, please send us your questions, direct message, third poll or Thompson Foundation, hashtag journalism and now, or just tag us in your tweet. Um, I'm just going to come back because we've talked about experts. We've touched on the word experts uh, throughout um, and I think the big problem with news analysis for generalist reporters uh, are like me. You know, I worked for many years as a TV on the day reporter for BBC News. So you didn't half the time know what your story was going to be until the morning meeting at 9 a.m. We had what we call this instant expert shift. You know, whatever the subject, you were expected to talk with some authority um, and a, a, certainly about it by the time you were on air. And it, it can be quite daunting. Um, so I wonder really what the advice is about using experts and academics to help with that and to get that level of authority in your analysis. Um, Farinaz, is it something you'd recommend, um, you know, this use of experts and, and, and academics to, to give some authority to the news analysis you're presenting? 
Oh, absolutely. I would love to, um, as a writer or as an editor, I would advise the reporter to ask them. However, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a double-edged sword with um, experts and academia in particular. Um, and uh, sometimes what happens is, A, it's very jargonized. B, it will always be very, very opinion-centric. So the path we don't want to go towards is getting them to write a news analysis. I'm not saying a clear no to it, but maybe they're more suited for opinion pieces, and that's how it always goes. Um, for a news analysis, it would be great to have them quoted, but how much of um, uh, the questions need to be directed towards them? How much do we um, want to include a very clear-cut, very sharp opinion? Um, how much of the jargon um, of any particular field or sector do we want to use? Those are the questions as editors we need to be thinking about. But of course, the experts' opinions are extremely important. It lends a legitimacy to it. Um, however, what happens is when, as you said, when we try to become the experts always, because there is um, there is a certain amount of prestige involved with when you are writing a news analysis uh, versus when you are writing just a news report. And uh, that is something that as journalists, we all want to do because uh, it's a, it's a, a learning curve and it's a series of growth uh, in your field. So we think from news reporting, we have to now move on to news analysis. However, it's again important that we know our subject and we know the people and the experts we are going to be asking uh, rather than just uh, uh, writing about something so that my name comes in the list of the people who write news analysis. That's not always fair or right. Um, Helen, you've, you've spoken already about working with experts. Um, you work with on subjects really that are incredibly complicated. I imagine they take some time to write. So do you have a sort of list really of go-to experts, people you can call on at a moment's notice if you like? You know, you've got the expertise, the independence uh, and the knowledge that you need if, only, if you've only got an hour, say, to write a piece of analysis. Thank you, Kath. Yes, I have a list of go-to experts, but now the problem comes with the audience getting tired of the experts that you use because in as much as you may use them every time, they will notice that this person always goes to expert X and they'll say, does it mean that there's no other expert in maybe epidemiology or climate change that you have to just speak to this one person? So if you keep speaking to the same people also, then it's going to tire the audience so you have to have to create a rapport with other experts that's not just the go-to experts that you have and then something else I've learned about experts is in as much as they're going to share with you information that you don't know you have to go prepared you can't just go to an expert and you don't know a thing about let's say in climate change the other day at COP27 they passed uh, something to do with loss and damage so if you go to an expert and you don't even know what loss and damage is, then you won't have a way of asking them relevant questions. If you go unprepared, you'll just ask anything and you may end up having a watered down story. So if you want to get a different stories with new ideas, go prepared, re do your research and have a variety of experts that you can go to at any time, not just the ones that you usually use them every day. Uh, great advice. Thanks very much, Helen. And uh, we mentioned about the, the need for, for experts to be independent. Um, I want to bring you back in here, Ewan, because that sort of relates to a question from or a comment we've had from Tujanin Shani. Um, it directly relates to what we've just been talking about with um, analysis versus opinion, because, of course, experts will have their own opinion as well. Um, Tujanin says op-eds op work differently from news analysis Hypothetically speaking, your opinions must not in any way obscure the truth. So objectivity is important. So this is someone who thinks that actually objectivity is is central. I just wonder, you and what what how you would respond to that. Sorry, sorry, Kath, could you just repeat the yes, question again? Yes, certainly. In fact, we've got another question come in just to to relate to to it. Two comments really about objectivity. Um, 
about the fact that, hypothetically speaking, your opinions must not in any way obscure the truth. So objectivity is important. And another comment here, uh, for me, there's no proper journalism without objectivity. The quest to be as objective as possible in every report or write-up should be the primary motivation in the work of a journalist. I just wondered if you res could respond to that in light of really what you had to say about objectivity earlier on. Um, the, uh, the, the, whenever I write... Um, I'm writing for the reader um, or the uh, listener. Um, I, I don't write uh, necessarily for a news editor. Sometimes, if you're being pragmatic, then obviously you want to interest the news editor and hope the news editor. Does. But primarily, uh, I'm writing for um, the reader or listener. And I want to give that person... Um, who's like maybe they've paid for a newspaper or maybe they're getting it for free. It doesn't matter. I want to give them the most honest account I possibly can of the uh, events that have happened. Um, so, I, as I said, I don't believe, I think objectivity is the wrong word um, because our own, we can't overcome our own prejudices and bias. Um, but what uh, we can do is to be as fair as possible, and that means reflecting uh, honestly um, what's being said by people, trying to stand back, trying to be neutral. Uh, so I think fairness is a much better word than uh, uh, objectivity. Um, it, as for, if I was writing news analysis... Can, 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 I, I, can I, I just come in there, Because yeah. who, who yeah. then decides what's fair? Because if you're, if you're writing for one newspaper, they might have a very difficult, politi a dif different political leaning to another newspaper. Yeah, um, if, if I, I might uh, be interviewing a politician uh, that I don't particularly like, um, but I will, I, I won't try and take his words out of context. So I wouldn't use a quote that isn't particularly good. I will try and present that politician in the best possible light uh, as honest a reflection of what that politician is saying um, I, I, I wouldn't um, I, I wouldn't abuse uh, the, um, this position that journalists are in uh, the, the power that journalists have uh, in reporting the world um, so I, uh, I, I would try and be for an, as honest an account as I possibly could. Um, on the issue of experts, if I'm writing news analysis, uh, I try and get find someone involved in an event that the news reporter has missed. Maybe if it was an election, news reporters um, been speaking to politician X and Y, I'll try and find someone who is at the event could provide some insights. I'll only go to analysts if I, if I can't find people who are right at the centre of events, or you find, you go and speak um, uh, as, um, you, you humanise stories, you go and see, speak to people who are uh, going to be impacted uh, by uh, e events. Um, it's only as a last resort, I would go to analysts and maybe find an academic and again, you'd have to be careful. You, um, uh, as Helen said, you if you keep going to the same ones all the time, um, then I think uh, that tends to sort of discredit you as a journalist. Um, too often you see people, uh, in Britain they call it rent-a-gob. Uh, you just go to a politician that's always available to give a view. He's always at the end of a phone. Um, you want someone that actually knows about the event uh, rather than just going for the e easy option of somebody that's uh, available. Great. Thanks, Ewan. Um, we've just had a, a question here from Evelyn Okaku. Uh, she says, if a journalist, if as a journalist you are writing about a very sensitive issue, like a community <coughs> ravaged by killings, where you have to talk about the many nuances, including the various parties involved in these killings, 
How do you ensure the full facts and still maintain your safety and that of your sources? Um, we've said earlier, haven't we, that you know, great news analysis usually involves you getting out from behind your desk and going to where the story is. Um, and with that, as Evelyn's highlighted, can come an element of uh, danger to yourself and to your sources. So, so how? What advice do you give? I, I put this to, to Faranaz, if I could, because you're working in an area, as is Helen, in fact. Um, when you're talking about climate and environmental stories, these come with with dangers. So, so what sort of advice would you have about maintaining your safety and that of your sources? Thanks, Catherine. So, um, safety comes first. Stories are brilliant and. Um, it's important to get the stories out there, but we cannot, um, again, I would speak more as an editor who's commissioning and um, have been a reporter. And that's when, you know, when you're a reporter, I think it's the job of the editor or the person commissioning it to you that they um, bring you back uh, uh, and make you weigh the pros and cons. Uh, very recently this happened that there was a brilliant story and, um, uh, a very bright young female journalist had uh, offered to do it for us. However, weighing the pros and cons, and it's important that um, we know the area uh, where we are commissioning the story. Um, it was just not safe for her to go in those areas as a, a, a female, much as that sounds uh, sexist, but that was the bare fact. So we eventually had to uh, tell her not to do that story. So it's always important uh, to weigh the pros and cons and um, um, make sure that the journalist stays safe. Having said that, uh, sometimes um, in newspapers, so uh, not in long form pieces or not maybe news analysis, but I've done that myself uh, as somebody who was reporting on the Pakistani elections uh, years back. Uh, we sometimes have to end up writing without bylines. Uh, we run it by our editors. We try not to take a lot of risks. Yet some stories do need to be told. So you miss the glory uh, and that moment you have when the next day the story is out or the few hours later when the story is out. You don't get your byline, but at least the story is out there. Um, Helen, I just want to bring in you here because you had mentioned earlier about a reporter who'd gone out to the place where the story was and exposed all those little nuances that you don't necessarily get from reporting behind your desk. But how do, do you think of your own safety when, when you do get out from behind your desk and think, actually, I, I need to expose the story behind the story here, so I need to go to where it's happening? Do you factor in safety there for yourself and your sources? Yes, I do, because when they say uh, there's no story worth dying for, you have to believe it. So before going out, have sort of your own security assessment of where you're going. And that means you have to speak to the people on the ground. You have to have fixers who, who will tell you what the environment you're going to is like. That way you will know that when you go there, are you going to, to be received warmly or are you going to, to be received with hostility? And giving an example of uh, writing a story about um, the impacts of climate change, say you're going to a flood, uh, flood, uh, flood, zone, uh, flood zone area and you know very well that that place, you can't swim. So how do you go to a place that you can't swim and you're going to a flood area and there's no, there's no one there to save you. you don't know how to use a boat or anything so instead of going to the field in this case you just have to use the people who are there to tell you their story first and or from a different place that will not make you be a victim of the floods that you want to report about so having that assessment and having fixers on the ground will help you to be prepared beforehand when you're doing a story that is sort of risky to your life Thanks very much for that, Helen. Um, before we go, I want to go back to this idea of honesty and transparency, um, because one way of getting around it, you and you talk about in the course, the importance of labelling stories. Can you just explain what you mean and why it's important? Um, labelling um, is, is one of the best ways of avoiding this confusion about what's news 
uh, what's news analysis, what's um, opinion. Um, if Traditionally, if you buy a newspaper, the news is on the front page and it will be page two, three, four, eight, nine, ten. Then you re reach the editorial opinion section and that will be full of com columnists, uh, the opinion writers. So in the newspaper, it's clear what what is news and what is the opinion. Um, but when you're reading the news on, say, a mobile phone or um, uh, news that's online, uh, sometimes the, these divisions aren't as clear-cut. So it's important to label story. Um, I, I, I was looking at the third poll earlier today, and uh, they label... Uh, uh, I was looking at uh, Farah Naz's uh, pieces, and they, they were all labelled news analysis, opinion, uh, news. Uh, so everybody has to do that. If, if you don't do that, then it creates a lot of um, confusion. And then people will say, oh, you can't trust these journalists. Um, they're presenting this as a news story, but it's actually opinion. Uh, whereas if it had been clearly labelled as opinion uh you wouldn't be sort of open to that kind of accusation. Farinaz, one thing I noticed reading analysis pieces by third poll is your use of hyperlinks. Is that part of the being honest and transparent? I just wondered if you could explain why you include them. Oh, absolutely. Um, so A, um, they help us with word economy. Uh, it helps us not having to say the thing in detail. And uh, secondly, of course, we can't take credit for something that is being attributed to, say, a report or a story, um, and somebody else has broken it. So we have to be clear and honest about it, that we are not the ones breaking this story. However, we have looked into this um, subject from all possible angles. It actually says um, way well about us that we have researched the news that has been out on the subject. And that is why sometimes we are also cross-sharing through hyperlinks other news. Uh, but very importantly, um, the research or the data or where it's been taken from. Also, sometimes our own um, uh, media platform has done uh, substantial work on the same subject. So we like to bring that in as well. Um, Helen, you're part of a new generation of journalists. You know, when I started, we basically told people the news, and I think there was an assumption uh, they'd believe us for the most part. I wondered what it's like now, really, for a, for a journalist coming into a world of, of social media and mis- and disinformation. Do you have to work hard at gaining trust? You really have to work hard in gaining trust because right now um, so many people can create anything using the digital tools. We have bots, we have people creating pseudo accounts that can have your news website and have a story that is linked to you, but it's not yours. So you really have to work hard and ensure that your credibility sets you apart, apart from what uh, the, the people trying to propagate misinformation are, are saying. So that way you have to ensure that you know the basics of fact-checking, you know the basics of open-source investigation. That's a course that is freely available online and even just in other media um, fellowships. So if you have these basics as a young journalist or even as a journalist who has been in the industry, you will be able to tell the, diff the story differently from what has been said by someone who is propagating this information. Um, great. Thanks very much, Helen. Um, sadly, that's all we have got time for. Thank you so much for joining us for this Twitter Spaces event from the Thompson Foundation and Third Poll. Uh, thanks, too, for your great questions. Apologies, deepest apologies uh, for those who we didn't get to. Uh, and thanks to our fantastic panel, Ewan McCaskill, Faranaz Zahidi and Helen Shikanda. And a final reminder that our three free art of storytelling training courses can be found at thompsonfoundation.org. Uh, best of luck writing your next piece of a news analysis. Perhaps you can share it with us uh, online. Uh, goodbye.